Welcome back to Season 3 of 12 Days in March. In this video, we'll finish up our discussion of renal vascular hypertension with a focus on renal artery stenosis and key derivatives. In case you're new to the recordings, a PDF of this and all recordings are available at the 12 Days website. So moving on to renal artery stenosis, let's try to make this a painless experience. This slide pretty much summarizes the full syllabus for Step 1. You just need to think about renal artery stenosis as the prototypic condition for hyperperfusion of one kidney. All the derivatives follow from this concept. Did someone just say renal hypoperfusion? That should generate some unpleasant flashbacks, as you recall our introductory recordings on blood pressure regulation. How will you ever forget that hypoperfusion means activation of the renin-angiotensin system? And in fact, this is how they're going to come after you. A predictable set of derivatives focusing on the physiologic response to the stenotic vessel, as well as questions related to the contralateral kidney. Before leaving this slide, it would be useful to burn this image in your mind's eye. You'll notice a shrunken, hypofunctioning kidney struggling to get some nutrition in the left image, and a big fat kidney working overtime to compensate for his atrophic buddy. So what are the demographics for renal artery stenosis? Here they are. The older patient with established vasculopathy. They will likely describe a patient with other manifestations of atherosclerosis, such as carotid or peripheral vascular disease. Not to be too glib, but when they have you play media in a hypertension question and you see auscultation over the renal arteries, that is a renal artery stenosis question, regardless of whether or not you hear the brewery. But I do want to broaden the context in which you think about renal artery stenosis. Stenosis physiology comes in all sizes and shapes. Here are two scenarios with younger patients hyperperfusing their kidneys. The first scenario, demonstrating that characteristic beaded appearance of the renal artery, has fibromuscular dysplasia. The graphic on the right is showing a tight stenosis with aneurysmal dilatation in a patient with Takayasu's arteritis. In both instances, the physiologic derivatives will be identical to renal artery stenosis, albeit with different pathology. I want to highlight one other phrase that is common in the discussion of vasculopathy, that being segmental involvement. The pathologic changes do not involve the entire vessel or vessels. They will vary in location and severity. Holding on to the concept of segmental involvement, you can reason your way through that beaded appearance. Those beads occur as a result of stenosis alternating with aneurysmal dilatation. Fibromuscular dysplasia is just a variant on the theme of segmental vascular pathology. Returning to our patient with renal artery stenosis on an atherosclerotic basis, you should be familiar with the macroscopic appearance. That should be straightforward. We have renal asymmetry due to the atrophic hypoperfused kidney. The CT image demonstrates this characteristic appearance as well as the gross pathology specimen. As with nephrosclerosis, the pathology is nonspecific, reflecting the state of chronic hypoperfusion. The pathology once again demonstrates scarring of the interstitium and glomeruli with generalized tubular atrophy. And here are the sexy physiologic derivatives. This will be short and sweet as we've pretty much covered these concepts already. What happens to the renin-angiotensin system in the hypoperfused kidney? Answer, it is activated with angiotensin II and aldosterone flying high. What is going on with the contralateral well-perfused kidney? Answer, the renin-angiotensin system is suppressed or inactive. The afferent arterial is well perfused and the macula densa is loaded with salt. It is just trying to do its thing to maintain a normal fluid balance. And finally, what happens to filtration fraction when the afferent arterial is constricted as occurs during renal hypoperfusion? Answer, nothing. It doesn't change. With afferent arterial constriction, or dilation for that matter, we are dealing with a preglomerular issue, so to speak. Whereas the renal plasma flow is decreased, the GFR is proportionally decreased. That's a fun little derivative, which also pops up when discussing the vascular effects of non and inflammatory drugs. These interfere with prostaglandin-mediated dilation of the afferent arterial. So how will that rear its head? A classic vignette. Patient presents with a condition associated with decreased effective circulating volume. They pop a couple of a leave. What happens? Based on what we just discussed about the preglomerular location of the afferent arteriole, we know that the filtration fraction will remain unchanged. But you will recall that prostaglandins play a major role in the regulation of renal blood flow. So using that non agent just interfered with prostaglandin-mediated vasodilation, precipitating acute kidney injury.
And while we're in the neighborhood, make sure you're familiar with the three renal topics involving nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that will come up on the boards. Interference with renal perfusion, interstitial nephritis, and papillary necrosis. And that wraps up the syllabus for renal artery stenosis with a little sidecar on nonsteroidals. Make sure you appreciate this is the prototypic condition of renal hyperperfusion. There are a cluster of well-defined derivatives including patient demographics, renal pathology, and most important, the physiologic consequences of chronic hypoperfusion. And to complete our discussion of renovascular hypertension, there are a few key takeaways to be familiar with on fibromuscular dysplasia. This slide pretty much tells the whole story. It is described as a non-inflammatory, non-atherosclerotic angiography. As mentioned a few slides back, it does have a characteristic angiographic appearance that is generated by regions of stenosis alternating with aneurysmal dilatation. This accounts for the beaded appearance. Not a lot more to know. Be familiar with the demographics, which include a young patient or child with significantly elevated blood pressure that is not attributable to an endocrinopathy. As this disorder is vasculopathy, other vessels such as the carotid may be involved. And what I didn't mention in the discussion of renal artery stenosis, the classically described drop in GFR after initiating ACE is suggestive of a stenotic process. The drop in GFR, or rise in creatinine, is simply a manifestation of renal dependence on angiotensin II in the setting of arterial hypoperfusion. If you vasodilate the efferent arterial, the GFR will drop as already discussed. Whereas physiologically, renal artery stenosis and fibromuscular dysplasia behave similarly, the two entities will be distinguished on the basis of pathology and angiography. And for the 20th time, here's another picture of those same damn beaded appearing blood vessels. And although in this slide I am listing arteriograms for the boards, fibromuscular dysplasia is the only one where you might be expected to make a diagnosis on appearance alone. In PAN, or Takayasu, the vignettes will be replete with other descriptors or pathology to get you across the finish line. Fibromuscular dysplasia, on the other hand, can be as simple as a young patient with refractory hypertension. Her angiogram is shown. Choose the correct pathology or diagnosis. And what is that pathology? Fibromuscular dysplasia is characterized by fibromuscular thickening. Yay, that was easy. The thickening can involve any layer, so they can't ask, but the media is most commonly involved. And again, we see that same nonspecific manifestation of renal hypoperfusion if the renal parenchyma were to be biopsied, including atrophy and fibrosis. And that completes this journey in our 20-part series on blood pressure regulation and renal vascular hypertension. I hope you didn't fall asleep driving in your car or in between sips of coffee. We'll finish up hypertension for step one with the endocrinopathies coming up in the days ahead. If you have any questions or concerns about any of this junk, drop me a post at 12 days. Be cool.